cabins can be a great idea for a getaway, but be wary as to the types of people that they attract, or the horrors that you might experience whilst inside. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. This all happened about 15 years ago, when I was 20, in a little cabin, far off in the Canadian wilderness. My buddy has a family cabin, which has been in the family for generations. It is down a long dirt road, deep in the forest. There are no lights around, and the cabin has no electricity, running water, nor insulation. The house does not have a bathroom. An outhouse is located some 20 meters from the house, among the pine trees. We would go there every weekend, and on holidays, to spend some quiet time. A many screwed up, esoterotic things happened in that cabin. But on one occasion, needless to say, we got completely freaked out. Following an incident, during one weekend, we convinced our girlfriends at the time to come and partake in the weirdness so that they could see for themselves. We got to the cabin around 8pm on a Friday night and decided to unpack the car and prepare for the incoming storm. We light a fire in the kitchen and start making a meal. Nothing happens. We decide to go to bed. My girlfriend and I decide to take the room closest to the stairs. That leads to the second floor, while my friend and his girl decide to sleep in the room closest to the main entrance. We go around the house and check the windows and doors and set off to bed. A little side note, it's important actually, the main entrance to the house is on a screen covered patio which has a screen door that can only be locked and latched from the inside. We latch the patio door and lock the main door. We always leave the key in the lock of the main door from the inside, as that way no one can break in with a key. Silly I know, but we always make sure of it. At around 3am, I check my watch. I am woken up by the sound of the front door opening and hear the screen door being banged closed. I figure my buddy must have gone to the outhouse. The weird thing is that there is a hell of a storm going on out there. I wait about half an hour, but I don't hear my buddy come back in. At this point, I get up get my flashlight and head onto the screened patio. I move to the end and try to light the outhouse. I call out his name, no answer. At this moment, I realize that the front door is unlocked and the screen door is unlatched. Somebody is out there for sure. I grab my trusty blade and head out towards the outhouse to make sure I don't lock Buddy out. But no one's there. I check around with my flashlight and there's no one to be found. So I go back into the house, latch the screen door and get into the house and lock it once again. I do a quick tour of the house and nobody is up. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking that I've locked my buddy out. So I go to the room he's staying in and give a quick look. He's there with his girlfriend. What the hell? I think to myself. 
so I go back to sleep. The next morning, I wake up and see that my buddy is out with his girl. So we decide to make breakfast. I am on this patio and my buddy comes back with this girl. He's looking at me with this weird look and asks, what the hell was all that about last night? What do you mean? I ask, confused. Last night, I heard you go outside, and then you came back, came into my room, sat on the corner of the bed, woke us up, and started talking about my Uncle Bob. I told you we were sleeping, but you kept rambling on, telling me Bob would no longer be a burden. How do you even know Bob? I never told you about him. Get out of here, I say. And his girlfriend confirms that I was in the room for a good 20 to 30 minutes, and then just got up and left. At this point we commence shitting bricks, as I explain to him that I took a look inside the room for a moment to make sure he was outside, because I heard the door. Later that night, we drive back. Our girlfriends are now totally convinced we did not make up the story or other tales about this weird ass cabin. At about 10 p.m. that night, my buddy calls me freaking out. He informs me that his grandfather just called him to tell him that his Uncle Bob died the night before at around 4 a.m. On a side note, having been in the family for generations, his father told me that the cabin is located on some hot zone of paranormal activity. For years, the family has experienced all kind of crazy shit. I actually have no idea what happened, but it was extremely freaky that not only our two events were completely different to each other, but the fact that he said I allegedly foretold his uncle's death, and it wasn't even me. I'm a small, 21-year-old female from Northern Ontario. I live on a fairly large plot of forest, in a small cabin-sized home with my husband and my two kids, out in the middle of nowhere. My husband works about an hour away, and I stay home with our kids, who were six months and two years old. When this incident happened, it was midwinter and very cold and snowy. My husband had been storm stayed at work because the plows had not been able to run the previous day. That isn't really unusual given the remote area in which we live. It was about six o'clock, and it was already dark. And I was cleaning up the kitchen after dinner, while my kids sat on the floor watching TV. There was a knock at the window, besides where my kids were eating. I looked up, and there was nothing there. I walked over to the window, and glared out of it, the knife I had been washing in my hand. I had a bad feeling about this. The knock definitely sounded like one made by human knuckles on glass. But I saw nothing, and suppose I kind of shook it off. Later that night, the knock came again, this time at my kid's window. I had had it. So I grabbed our shotgun from the locked gun cabinet and stepped out onto the porch in my pyjamas and my husband's boots. I was so angry, I wasn't about to let someone mess with my kids. I screamed out that I knew he was there and that if he didn't bugger off and leave my babies alone, I swear to God I would shoot him in the face and there was no reply. Nevertheless, I somehow knew there was someone still out there. So I cocked my gun and fired around into the air, so whoever it was would know that I was not kidding around. 
Not the smartest or safest thing to do, I know. But what else could I have done? Besides, it worked. There was a rustling from around the side of my house, and a man ran off into the trees. Keep in mind, it's minus 30 degrees Celsius out here. I stood there for five minutes, making sure he didn't come back. And I went back in to call my husband and the police. Thank God the police were able to come, despite the weather, and looked everywhere around our house, and caught the arsehole wandering through the woods about a half kilometre away from our home. I don't know what happened to him after they arrested him, but he never came around again. My father, mother and I make frequent trips to the Smoky Mountains and stay in the cabin they have near Pigeon Forge. However, this particular trip still haunts me to this day. About eight years ago, we stayed in a cabin that had an alarm system. It was already dark outside when we reached the cabin and got settled in. We set the alarm and thought we should watch a movie together. While we were watching the movie, the security system alarm went off. The alarm only was to go off if a door was opened. We checked the cabin top to bottom to find absolutely nothing out of the ordinary. The next morning, we called the company that rented the cabin to us to have them check out the alarm system. Someone came and checked out the alarm and said that he had been called out to our cabin multiple times within the past month with the same problem. Since it's only the first day at the cabin, I am already feeling a little bit creeped out. I notice that there is a book on the table that guests can sign and talk about how much they love the cabin. As I was reading more and more, I noticed that many of them mentioned feeling unsafe, and some even mentioned that they found wet footprints on the deck where the hot tub is. I told my family about these stories and they told me that I was just trying to scare them. The same night, we go to bed. My father slept in the basement of the cabin. I sleep on the main floor beside the kitchen and my mother sleeps on the top floor. My dad snores so incredibly loudly that we need to sleep away from him in order to remain asleep. It was about 2 a.m. when I was woken up by the fridge door closing. I looked at the bright light from the fridge that was pouring into my room from the crack underneath my closed bedroom door. I noticed that the light would come and go as the fridge door seemed to continue to open and close. I assumed it was one of my parents leaning on the fridge door, trying to decide what they wanted to eat for a late snack. However, I felt weird and didn't even consider to get out of bed to join in on the snack. The fridge light disappeared slowly and I heard footsteps walk away from my bedroom and head in the direction of the steps to go up to my mother's room. The footsteps seemed to stop for a second, then start the trip up the stairs anew. All of a sudden they stopped. I assumed that my mother had made it to her room, so I fell back asleep. The next morning, I woke up and go directly to my mum and ask her what she decided to eat for a late night snack. She looked at me confused. What? She asked. I told her that I thought she was at the fridge last night, opening and closing the fridge, because I heard her go back upstairs after 
and that it happened a little after 2am. She looked at me and said, Oh, I thought it was you. As at this time in my life, I was known to sleepwalk every now and then. I saw you standing at the top of the stairs last night around the time. I assumed you were sleepwalking, because you looked at me and went back downstairs. So at this point I start to freak, and get sick to my stomach. The rest of the trip, I slept with my mother on the top floor. I didn't experience anything else the rest of the trip. I never went anywhere alone in that cabin. A couple of months go by after our trip, when my dad tells me he was looking to rent another cabin for the trip. We go to look at the cabin that we rented last time, and found out the cabin had been closed and is no longer available to rent. Out of curiosity, he did some research to find out that many guests experienced something in the cabin. The complaints ranged from feeling unsafe to people thinking someone was in the cabin that shouldn't be there, to people leaving before their vacation was over. I'm not sure what my mother and I had experienced that night at the cabin, but I now know that we weren't the only ones to go through something like that. I was 11 when this happened. Ariel, my older sister, was 14 and Belle, my younger sister, was eight. Yes, my parents are Disney fans. What can you do? My dad was a freelance programmer when I was younger. He made great money on his jobs. But because he was so heavily in debt, half a million to be exact, and my mother was not the most gifted person on balancing a budget, we never had much free money available. This meant that we went on a vacation once every few years, and usually that would just be to a relative's house. My dad had just finished a long project for a big client, and we were celebrating the occasion with a new movie. It happened to be Final Destination, because my dad loved watching scary stuff and scaring the daylights out of my sisters and I. We were in the middle of the movie when the phone rang. He went to get it and came back to grab my mum while I kept watching the movie. Belle took the opportunity to pause the film and take Duchess, our dog, captive because she was scared. They came back about 10 minutes later and announced that we were going to be spending the weekend in a cabin. We didn't know what to make of it, but apparently the client he'd been helping owned a nice cabin by a lake in the mountains and offered to let us lodge there this weekend for a considerably reduced price. It was Thursday, so Mum went into panicked frenzy and began packing, so we didn't end up watching the rest of the movie. After school the next day, we packed up the family van and headed up into the mountains. It was a two and a half hour drive, so it was quite late by the time we arrived. We unloaded the van and went exploring in the cabin. It was a ranch style cabin with a little nook thing you could climb up to that was about head height. It was about three feet tall and probably meant for storage, but it was an excellent place for the three of us to hang in and play games. There were a few dozen board games up there, so we started playing once we decided on who got which room. Mom and Dad got the largest one. Ariel claimed the smaller one with a twin bed. So Belle and I got the last room, 
which had a queen-sized bed that we would share. We had a window on the right side of the bed, without a curtain, and a lamp on the left of the bed. It was the only light source in the room, and there was a closet opposite of the bed. It was locked, and we couldn't get in there, and I never did figure out what was inside. We went to bed at around 11. Unfortunately though, Bell is a kicker, so I slept by the lamp in case she ended up knocking it over. I remember lying down, and I must have instantly fallen asleep, because the next thing I knew, Bell was gripping my arm and trying to burrow underneath me. She was squeaking something in fright, and I couldn't understand what was happening. I sat up, looked towards her, and saw something pale and human-shaped moving away from the window. My sleepy brain took several moments to process, and that's when I realized what was happening. I shot out of bed, dragging Bell with me. We rushed into our parents' room, who told us that we were simply imagining things. Mum told us to go back to bed, and if we saw anything, to let them know. I, much to my current annoyance, agreed with them, and went back in the room with Belle. We switched positions, because she refused to go back to bed by the window. I told her a story to get her to sleep, and promptly conked out after her, and I did not wake up until morning. The next day, we went exploring around the lake for about an hour, before Dad decided we'd spend the day in town. They had a lot of small shops, and my parents went into every single one of them. We ate lunch and dinner in the town, and then our family returned to the cabin. Ariel made a joke about something as we neared the cabin, and I remember everyone laughing before my dad suddenly stopped, held up his hand to make everyone stop as well. He then took another step towards the cabin and pushed the door open with a single finger. I thought it was strange that the door wasn't latched, but I didn't put the obvious together right away. Dad? Ariel shuffled nearer to Belle, but my dad gave his head a shake to let her know she needed to be quiet. He went into the cabin and disappeared inside for a minute or two while we stood on the porch. Mum called out his name and he called back, saying that we could come inside. We did, and found him standing in the middle of the living room with a frown. He locked the door once we were inside and took Mum to the bedroom for a quick chat. Ariel, having caught on to what was happening, opted to distract Belle and I by suggesting another round of the board game that we had been playing the night before. We hadn't been playing for more than five minutes when my mother and father returned. Mum was about cleaning the dishes from breakfast when my father joined the game. We played for a few hours before Dad told us that we needed to go to bed. It was only nine at that point, which made Ariel very angry. She was arguing that she was allowed to be up until 10.30 on school nights and later on weekends. Belle and I went to bed while they argued. We climbed back into the same spot that we slept in, Belle by the window and me by the lamp. I read to Belle for a bit before we drifted off. I woke up with Dad rushing into our room. He scooped Belle out of bed and grabbed my hand. He dragged me out of the room and into the hall, where I saw Ariel getting a similar treatment from Mum. 
I became aware of a high-pitched whine in the living room and saw our dog sitting at attention by the back door. She was bristled and seemed anxious. Dad didn't put Belle down and didn't let go of my hand. They rushed out of the house and into the van. Dad went back to get the dog and then he burned rubber getting out of that cabin. He drove all the way home without talking once and it took a half hour for Duchess just to calm down. He told Aria what happened the next day but Belle and I didn't find out until years later. What happened was that he'd woken up that night to what sounded like moaning outside the window in his room. He jumped up to look what was going on and had found the front door unlocked. Stuff in the kitchen had been moved and Duchess had started to growl at the back door which was ajar. He locked it and got us out the house. He went back the next day to get our luggage and found several pairs of footprints outside Bell's and my window. I live in a cabin on about 50 acres of field and wood with my mum. We've been enjoying a day of sitting on our asses and watching television. However, I had to mow my grandmother's yard this afternoon. I told my mum that I have a yard to mow today, and the conversation went as follows. Me. It's cooler outside. I guess it's a good time to get off my ass. Mum. Or you could just call her and tell her you'll do it tomorrow. I reply. Now nah, I'm going to get my things together and go. So, I go grab my headphones and e-cigarette. So, I'm walking down the driveway, topped the hill, and lo and behold, there were at least 20 MS highway patrol cars in the middle of my field, about 70 feet away from my truck. I had just assumed that a neighbour who has a history of cutting up had gotten himself into huge trouble with the law over drugs or something. When I was pulling out of the gate, I told the local cops that I am the landowner and asked if everything was alright. He said, it's gonna be. On my way to my grandmother's house, I called my mum and I said, I don't want to put you off, but there are about a hundred cops in our field. She said that she'd go on her way to check it out. I called her a few times, assuming that she'd been talking to the cops or something. I knew she'd be safe with all of those cops around, so I went ahead and started mowing the grass. Plus, my grandmother only lives a few miles down the road. When I was about halfway done mowing, she called me, saying the troopers had nothing to say, but one of the local cops that we knew said that it was a guy wanted in Texas for shooting three people, killing two and injuring one. The guy drove into our field and shot himself after being confronted and surrounded by troopers. When I was done mowing, I headed home to pick her up and we drove back to talk to the last few troopers. I told them that I'm the property owner and asked if it was okay and all clear and if everything was safe now. They said that they had just moved the body in the car, so it's clear. I said, wow, all the way from Texas, huh? Well, be safe, thanks. We drove over to the site after the troopers left. Right behind our old pecan tree were a bunch of tire treads and a giant bloody spot in the grass. We were still in a state of what the hell. Going by the press conference we watched, the guy shot himself as I was going up the driveway. I didn't even hear the gunshots or sirens, but I remember having my radio turned up. You know what's funny? This guy managed to find my field, but somehow FedEx can't.
and I'm just glad that the guy didn't make it all the way to our cabin, which he was extremely close to. Who knows, it could have ended up very badly. He may have taken my mother or me hostage, and he may have even ended our lives that day. I'm so glad that we remain unscathed after that, because we were seriously close to mortal danger. It was about late November in Colorado, and I was around seven or eight, and my father got the idea of taking us all for a weekend to a cabin that he was going to rent. My mother thought it was a great idea for me, my sister, my father and my mother to bond. So, that's exactly what happened. We rented a cabin for a few days. We took off school on Friday to get a head start on going there, which I had no issue with. We got there and it was sure cold. Well, it's almost December. So I guess it made sense it was going to be cold. Anyway, we all got set up and decided where we'd all sleep. We ate dinner and then we all got set up for bed and were thinking about what we would do tomorrow. We got there kind of late, so we couldn't do much on the first day. That first night though, I heard noises outside. It sounded kind of like footsteps. I looked out the window and saw nothing. So I figured it must have been an animal. I tried to get back to sleep. Then less than 15 minutes later, I heard it again. I woke up my sister, which she was around 11 at the time, and she heard it as well. We both walked over to the window and saw something out there. We weren't quite sure what it was. We decided it would be best for it not to see us. So we went back to sleep. But I had a hard time sleeping that night. And so did my sister. But when we eventually awoke, my mother was inside making breakfast and my father was outside. I asked my mum if I could go outside with my dad, and she told me sure. While my sister stayed inside and waited for my mother to finish breakfast, I walked outside and my father was talking to some man, a short, chubby man. He had a shaved head and was wearing a veteran cap. He looked really nervous too. For some reason, he was sweating a lot as well, even though it was freezing outside. I walked over to him, and my father looked at me and said, Oh, this is my son. The man looked at me and said, Nice to meet you, kid. My name's Patrick. He smiled and looked at me. I smiled and greeted him back. And it may have been rude at the time, but I was just a kid, and asked him, You look kind of scared. Are you alright? And he just coughed a reply. Yeah, I'm fine. Just went through some shell shock. I'm a veteran. He said it, and I could already tell with the cap he was wearing. He seemed normal after that, though. My father seemed to really like this guy. I liked him at first too. And he told my father he had also rented a cabin with his family. And that they were really close to us. So he decided to introduce himself. My father invited him inside for breakfast. And he stayed. It was normal. I went outside to play after that with my father and Patrick. While outside, I fell and scraped my knee and started crying. My father was inside at the time, a bad time for him to be inside. 
My mother was calling for him and he ran inside while I was out there with Patrick. Patrick ran over to me and told me to come with him to his cabin because he had band-aids. I agreed and went with him, which wasn't very smart. I went with Patrick. We talked about what I liked doing and I told him about video games that I played and stuff like that. Then the things got weird. He asked me what shoe size I was and how old I was. I didn't know what my shoe size was, but I told him about my age. He just kind of chuckled and said something along the lines of good to know. Also, his cabin was situated absolutely nowhere near ours. It was way back and took about 25 minutes to just get there. I was tired and there was no point in a band-aid anymore. But I still decided to keep going as we had walked for such a distance. We entered the cabin and he told me to go in first. So I did. As soon as I walked in, I realized something. There was nobody there, no family. I asked him where his family was and he didn't answer me, pretending as if he didn't hear. He locked the door. I then got kind of frightened. He told me, I'll be back with the band-aid, kiddo. He walked into the kitchen and pulled one out of somewhere and then walked back and told me to have a seat and that he'd put it on. I sat down and he applied the band-aid. He also held my leg with his other hand and rubbed it up and down and told me that I was a rather muscular kid and that he liked that. I kind of got afraid and immediately stood up. He asked me what was wrong and I told him that nothing was wrong but that my leg was feeling much better. I then thought my parents must be worried sick about me and that I should hurry back but he insisted I stay a little longer and ate there with him. I didn't want to but I was alone and if I ran I honestly didn't think I would be able to make my way back to my cabin. Their door was locked too, so I agreed and decided to eat with him and get it over with quickly. He asked me how much I weighed. I said I guessed around 73 pounds and then he had a smile go over his face. He nodded and said, perfect weight. I asked him perfect weight for what and he just kept smiling. I was really weirded out and asked him if I could go. He told me no and that they were just getting started and that I shouldn't miss out on the fun. He had such a weird tone when he said that too. Then I heard a bang from the bedroom. It was a closed door. Patrick stood up and he looked very angry. He walked into the room and shut the door behind him. Then I heard him yelling. Did I tell you you could move? No, you stay where you are. I have company. He then walked out with a smile on his face and shut the door. Sorry about that. It was just my wife. She's really sick and not allowed to see visitors today. He was smiling when he said that. I wanted to go. I then looked around the room and noticed that there were clothes everywhere. And it was really messy. He must be living out here. At that moment, his wife walked out the room. I'm hungry, she said. And he looked pissed. Get back in there. His wife was extremely pale and looked like she had been crying a lot. She was sniffing and had red circles around her eyes. She looked at me and she walked back in the room. I asked where his kids were and he didn't answer. He told me he had kid clothes that he wanted me to try on and that was the last straw. 
I had to get out of that situation, and I didn't know how. I started crying, then he hugged me. He told me, it'll be okay, little one. Nothing is going to happen. Just try on these clothes. He walked into the back room, and I thought that would be the perfect time to leave. I unlocked his door and tried to leave as quietly as I could. I didn't care if I got lost anymore. I didn't want to take any more chances with Patrick, if that was even his real name. I had a feeling he had been lying. He lied about having kids, and he's lying about God knows what else. I was in the woods trying to find my way back. I was still close to his house, close enough to hear the shouting. I heard him yelling stuff to his wife, things along the lines of, where the hell did he go? And I knew I shouldn't have left him alone. You probably let him leave. I could have sworn I heard him call her a whore and a bitch several times. And then it stopped. I stopped in my tracks and heard footsteps. I went and hid behind a tree and looked in his direction. He was outside and seemed to be looking for me. I was far enough away to where I could barely see him, but I could tell he was looking for something. He then stepped out of the forest and I heard him shout, Hey kid, it's okay, you can come back. You don't have to try on the clothes. I have toys back in my cabin and all you have to do is come back. I then ran. I ran as fast as I could in a straight line, in hopes to find somebody in my family. I was running away, and thought I heard shouting, but I didn't stop to hear it. Then about after an hour of running, I saw a cabin. My cabin! I ran to it, and my father was outside looking for me. I ran up to him crying, telling him Patrick wasn't a good guy that he was really weird and he was touching my legs and stuff. My father immediately called the person he rented the cabin from and he said that nobody had rented that cabin. My father looked at me and told me never to follow a stranger again. We left that same day and asked for a refund. The guy renting them out apologised. The man having the cabin rentals called the police and the police went back to check that there was no one there, not even the wife, but the clothes and belongings were still there. Nothing really happened after that. They asked questions and left and never called us or gave us any follow up of any kind. Patrick most likely wasn't his real name and he probably wasn't a veteran. I just want to know what happened to him and his wife, how he even got a wife in the first place, and how and why he lived back in that cabin. He seemed to have been living there for a while. I guess he left because he figured the police would be coming after him, because he didn't rent the cabin. So many questions that will never be answered. I want to share with you a strange story that happened to me and my ex-girlfriend. So my family owns a cabin on a small lake up in New Hampshire. We go there every summer. It's basically our home away from home. There are other houses on the lake, quite a few near us, but beyond that, it's a pretty rural area. Miles of wood stretched beyond the lake houses. So there's really no reason to be in the area unless you are hunting. Own a lake house, or are visiting the lake for whatever reason. So one night six years ago, it was late. My ex and I were laying in bed, just chatting about whatever. All of a sudden we hear footsteps outside the open window. The window lays only about halfway up on the wall side of the bed and is situated so that it opens right at the bottom of the bed where our feet are. The ground around my house 
is covered in layers of pine needles that drop from above. So it's pretty hard to walk quietly. But the footsteps sound like whatever was making them was trying their best not to be heard. They sounded relatively close, but we rationalized to ourselves that they were probably made by some sort of animal. A couple of minutes go by and we hear them again, except this time they seemed closer. They seemed to be right outside my window, still trying to move quietly. At this point, the two of us are starting to get a little freaked out. To our mutual horror, we look down and see a hand slowly coming through the window. Obviously, we scream and wake the house up, and my parents come running out of their adjacent rooms. We tell them what happened, and my father rationalizes that the event is a figment of my imagination. I know it wasn't. My ex and I both saw the same thing, so it simply couldn't be. To this day, I feel very uneasy staying in that room and always make sure to close my window before going to bed. I am 19 years old and have been a Boy Scout my entire life. I recently turned 19, so I cannot unfortunately be a Scout anymore. I became an Eagle Scout at a relatively young age, 17. Me and a few of my friends have been in the troop since we were 11. We went through the rankings together, and all our experiences revolved around each other. We grew up in a rural area of New Jersey, so we loved the outdoors. Camping, hunting, and fishing was our shit. One of my friends, Luke, asked me and my other friends Mark, Nick and Owen if we wanted to go out to a hunting reserve in Pennsylvania. His uncle owned around eight acres of woodlands with streams and lakes. He invited us for a four day camping and activity trip. Since we were all into that stuff, it was all set. We drove out on a Thursday night and it took about an hour and a half to get there. Once we got there, we get to a wooden cabin that Luke's uncle was letting him borrow. He unlocked it, and I have to say it was nice. It had a working toilet, stove, lights, and some other goodies. It wasn't the full outdoor and camping experience, but it was close. We bought a cooler with some drinks, and we were all set. It was nice. It was like it used to be. Us sitting around a fire and just talking. And around 12.30 at night, we went to bed. The day Luke woke us up around 6am to go fishing at the lake, we grabbed our gear and went out to the lake. It was a crisp morning and quite pretty and the sun was just beginning to rise with the sky turning a beautiful blue. We had about five minutes more of walking until we arrived. When we get there, we spread out a bit, but I was with Nick relaxing on the grass. I picked up my rod and went out for a few casts. We were all roughly 15 yards apart. The lake was very large, so you can barely see the other side. As I was casting, Nick muttered, What the hell? I turned to ask him what was up, and he pointed diagonally across the lake. A faint figure was standing. It looked tall, but I couldn't really make anything else out. I looked back at Nick, and I called Luke, Mark and Owen. They showed up, and we showed them, and it just kept standing there. We slowly walked away, and back to the cabin. We mostly forgot about it, playing cards and listening to music. When it was 1.30pm, we were hungry. 
we went up back to do a little charcoal grill and put some burger patties that we bought on the grill. We fired it up and Owen being the best cook made them. The rest of us were joking and hanging out when we heard some crunches from the woods surrounding the cabin. We stopped talking and looked over at the tree line about a hundred yards away and we saw a person who was trying to hide behind a tree. Just like I noticed before, he was tall, very tall, probably around six foot eight. We were scared shitless, and we lost it when we saw a head turn around from the tree. It was pale, and had black messy hair and a solemn expression on its face. It looked like what can be described as your stereotypical mental patient, wearing very baggy and worn clothes. Luke ran back into the cabin, grabbed his uncle's Remington 1700 hunting rifle and fired a shot into the air, warning the guy to get out now. We heard leaves crunching as he fled. By then, we all just wanted to get the hell out of there. Luke wanted to give it one more chance, so being good friends, we told him he was crazy. He was pretty much begging, so we said yes. We went into the woods for some hunting, just to observe nature, and we figured we could get a break from the cabin. When we returned two hours later, the cabin door was wide open. Luke stuttered. You saw me lock it, right? We said yes and he had a big deal about this to make sure we were safe. We were armed, so he raised his weapon as he walked in. The place was ransacked. Most of the food and beer had been gone. A few personal items weren't there, and there was a note on Luke's bed. It only had four words on it. It said his uncle's full name and Luke's. That was it. We grabbed our shit, hopped into the car and drove out of there. The most off-putting part about this was how the person knew Luke's name along with his uncle's. I'm in fear he knows Owen's, Mark's, Nick's and mine. And I really hope nothing like that ever happens to me. This happened about two years ago. I had just moved about an hour and a half away from home. The first time I had actually lived away from home. I was working on a kids' activity camp. All the staff lived in two massive cabins in the woods. There were about 40 people in each, two or three to a room. So you can imagine how big this cabin was. Anyway, everybody became really close. So people knew each other from previous years working at this particular camp. None of us really locked our doors because we all knew each other and everybody hung out in different friends' rooms all the time. On this camp, my job was working with the kids during the day and doing evening shifts on the bar, which was there for staff and teachers and parents that had come down with their children. One night, my roommate and I were both working an evening shift on the bar. She was finishing a couple of hours earlier than I. My roommate Debs decided that she was going back to the room and read and wait for me to finish in order for us to watch a movie. She'd been gone for about five minutes as that's how long it takes to get from the bar to the cabin. So my phone started ringing with her caller ID. I picked up the call as the bar was pretty dead and the only people who were in there were the staff. When I picked up the phone, nobody was saying anything on the other end. I put down to hear her butt dialing me. So I just hung up. After a minute, I get another phone call from a friend who lived across the hallway from us. She told me she thought I needed to get back to the room now. So I asked the guy I was with to cover me whilst I popped back to the room quickly. 
I walked down and there were about five people standing outside my room. I walked inside and my roommate was just in there crying, which is very out of character for her. All our stuff was over the room. Please note, this is very weird because I'm pretty sure I have OCD and often tidy my side as well as her side of the room, even if she didn't want me to. She went on to tell me that her phone had gone missing. I then asked her about her phoning me before I came back to the room and she had no idea what I was talking about. This means someone had taken her phone and knew who to call straight away. And also when she left work. There would be no point in stealing her phone as it was literally a worthless brick with a value no greater than 10 pounds. A few days later, we started noticing that things had gone missing. But, not normal things people would steal. They could have taken laptops, Kindles, a PlayStation and games. Instead, all they took was my bra and knickers. Some clean, and some from the dirty washing. This made me feel sick, especially because we knew everyone who we lived and worked with. For a few days, I kept getting these calls from her phone, with just silence on the other end. We obviously went and reported it with our bosses, and said that they would look into it. We kind of got blamed for leaving our door unlocked, which I understand is really stupid now. The creepy thing was, a few days later I walked into the staff lounge, and Debs' phone was just sitting, placed by the windowsill. Nobody was there, and nobody seemed to be around. At that point, I noped out of there and locked myself in my room until she came home. Nothing ever came of it, and we never found out who it was. But I definitely have a feeling it was someone that knew us quite well, and who knew when we would both be out of our rooms. For the life of me, I still don't know who stole my underwear. My roommate's phone and who trashed our room. But I definitely learnt a lesson not to leave your door unlocked, because there are always gross creepers out there, even when you don't expect it. I suppose all first paranormal experiences are always ground shaking, but what happened to me felt like I was in a movie. I know a lot of people who have experienced paranormal activity, and sometimes people experience things either before I arrive or after I leave. So deep down, I always wanted to experience something paranormal. I understand the paranormal is something that should be taken seriously, and I do not wish any ill experiences upon anyone or myself. But August of 2016 was chilling. At the end of spring semester 2016, I decided to run as secretary for my favorite organization on campus. The organization is a cultural organization and its executive board has seven positions. President, Vice President, Treasurer, Secretary, Historian, Freshman Rep, and PR, which are all open to run for. When election day came, I won by default, because no one else ran for Secretary that year. When all the board members were elected, we all tried to get to know each other a bit more. I've only heard of my board members so I definitely wanted to get to know them on a more personal level. Awesomely, every new board can go on a retreat together. Past boards had rented a cabin in the woods or gone camping. We opted to rent a cabin in a woodsy area. We were all excited to be in each other's presence and of course, to plan out upcoming events. We rented the cabin for three days and two nights, 
in a city that was about a 40 minute drive from my parents' home. We drove in two cars and arrived at the cabin early in the morning. The area was beautiful and there was a huge lake in the middle of the surrounding cabins. We were so excited that we decided to explore first before unpacking. The cabin had two levels to it. However, we only had access to the lower one. It had two bedrooms, one bathroom, and a living room on one side. The kitchen was on the other side, and the sides were divided by a sliding door. There was also a door in the kitchen that led to the backyard and lake. After exploring and sharing pictures on Facebook, we established sleeping whereabouts. I needed to use the bathroom, so I told my board members that I didn't care where I slept. When I returned, I was told that the historian, freshman rep, and PR people were sleeping in the living room. The vice president, treasurer, are in the room furthest away, and the president and I were going to be sharing the room closest to the living room. Everyone was okay with that, and we began unpacking. After unpacking, I turned on the flat screen in the living room and started surfing Netflix. Final Destination 3 appeared, and I chuckled. Wow, this movie is so old and lame. Let's watch it. After about 20 minutes or so, I heard the vice president ask, Wait, where's the PR girl? Everyone realized that the PR girl was not in the room and looked around. My first thought was, should I be worried? I then told the freshman representative to call the PR girl's phone. Her phone started ringing on the coffee table next to us. So I called out her name loudly to see if she was using the bathroom. I got no reply. That was strange. I wasn't worried yet though. So I told everyone that we would start searching for her if she wasn't back in five minutes. After five minutes, I hear the vice president say, Hey, come sit with us, to the PR girl. I turn around and see the PR girl standing between the sliding door with a dead look on her face. It made me feel sad. How come she isn't having a good time like the rest of us? I got off the couch and pulled her into the kitchen. I closed the sliding door and asked her where she went, saying that I was starting to worry. She immediately apologized and told me she had to step out to clear her mind. I felt sad that she wasn't feeling as upbeat as we were, but I didn't like how she left without telling us and without taking her phone. I told her, if you ever need time alone, just let us know. We'll respect that. Just communicate and please take your phone next time. Then I asked her if she wanted to come join us in the living room. She told me that she would rather not, so I decided to stay with her. I also thought this was the perfect time to get to know her better and ask her why she may be feeling down. I wanted to get to the bottom of the situation, so I tried being as direct as possible. I started asking her some questions that I thought might be related to what was wrong such as if it was family related. But after a brief questioning, she simply said that I couldn't help. She said, the reason I left to clear my mind was because of the scary movie. I don't do scary movies. It gives me anxiety and other things start to happen. I was relieved that that was the only reason she left. I tried to make light of the situation by saying, Oh, that's it. Nothing to worry about. I tried to change the subject too by saying, Remember what I said about getting to know each other more? Now, I know you don't like scary movies. 
I think we should tell the rest so they understand. She stopped me and said she didn't want to seem high maintenance and have everyone else stop watching because of her. I didn't want her to feel pressured in any way too, so I asked her more about her anxiety. What happened next threw me off a little, and that's when I started to worry a bit. So what is it exactly that happens when you have these anxiety attacks? She said, I start hearing things and seeing things. Honestly, I didn't know what to think. Either she's a little crazy or being for real, but most likely crazy. I just didn't know what to believe because I didn't know her well. But then I remembered something. One time I walked past her and heard her talking about how she was able to see spirits and communicate with them. But I was still leaning towards crazy or that maybe she's just very good at scaring herself. She continues on, but I'm zoning out thinking about how crazy she's sounding. I had to say something though. I needed to say something. As I mentioned earlier, I never experienced anything paranormal before. So it turned me into a see it to believe it person. However, in my culture, spirituality and spirits are kind of our belief and whatnot. I was raised and taught that there are spirits I've seen some unnatural things, but it wasn't enough to spook me, I guess. So then I kind of interrupt her with a, wait, so are you talking about something like beyond our dimension? She nodded. Now I really don't know how to feel or what to do. I wanted to make her feel better though. I asked her more questions to understand the situation. I asked her, if she thought being alone was a good idea, especially if she is experiencing what she mentioned. I also asked if she saw or was hearing anything now. She said she did earlier, before I began asking her more questions. Then the movie ended and everyone started making their way to the kitchen. The sliding door opened and I could tell everyone wanted to know what was going on. Although, she said that she didn't want to tell anyone what she'd shared with me. And my intentions were to make her feel better. I thought it would be a good idea to share that information with everyone. I wasn't trying to be a bad friend. I just thought if everyone was aware of this situation, everyone would be more comfortable with each other. However, I had another idea right before I could stop to tell it to her. I dodged everyone and walked right into the bathroom. I started calling the only person I thought could offer the best advice. I have a cousin who is a shaman. He is gifted with many abilities, such as being able to see and communicate with spirits. Here's another story. But I called him up and simply said that I had a friend who said she's scared because she sees and hears disturbing spirit related things. My cousin explained to me that there was not much we could do because we aren't shaman. However, there is one thing we could do because of our ethnicity and culture. I was told to bring a plate of food outside and offer it to the guardian of the land. I know it sounds kind of random, but it's a thing. I am to ask for protection by stating our intentions of being here. I thanked my cousin and came out to find the president. I quickly explained to her that the PR girl saw and heard some things and that now she's a bit paranoid. They all knew what I was talking about and also agreed to me offering food to the guardian spirit. I quickly put something together and brought it out to the nearby forest tree line. This was my first time doing something like this, although I've seen it done many times before but honestly never paid her much mind. Which is a shame, because so many of us are from the second generation of my culture and are losing touch. I do want to know more. 
After a minute to do my best of offering to the guardian spirit, I come back inside and let everyone know that the job was done. The president's sister is also a shaman, and when I got inside, he informed me that his sister had lit some incense and candles for us back at home. This was to protect us spiritually. Everyone was doing their thing for a while, but I wanted to let the PR girl know what I had done. I invited her to karaoke in the living room and told her about the food offering and how it's a thing in our culture. I also told her about the actions of the president's shame and sister. Then I apologized to her because I wasn't sure what her religion was or how she felt about everything. Fortunately, she was cool with it though. When everyone saw that we were all enjoying ourselves, they joined in and it was a very fun first night. The next morning I was half awake. I could hear the president getting dressed. Before he left the room, he said that the PR girl was outside sleeping by the dog. I thought it was kind of weird, so I shot out of bed, got dressed, and went towards the living room. That's when I saw the historian and freshman representative were still sleeping. The historian woke up and said that the PR girl never slept with her last night. I saw the president walking on the dock to the PR girl. They chatted for a bit and then made their way back to us. As soon as they got in, I asked the PR girl why she didn't sleep with the historian last night. She said she didn't know how she was supposed to sleep with the historian and explained that she had slept behind the couch with her jacket and purse. I felt so horrible. Does she think we don't like her or care about her? I mean, we even talked about who was sleeping where. I told her she was supposed to sleep with the historian and that she has a place to sleep. Honestly, it was in plain sight. Anyway, after that little mix up, we started prepping for tonight. We were all excited and wanted to be super hungry for the food that was going to be grilled. The day was filled with fishing, swimming, more singing, spicy noodle challenge and laughter. When the time came for grilling, everyone had a part to do. Soon the table looked like Thanksgiving Day and we were ecstatic. We felt even more pumped when the liquor came out. We ate, took shots, eight took more shots but we didn't want to be wasted so we ended up just eating more and more and doing our own thing for the rest of the night the historian and i were talking about singing some vocal range until she realized that the pr girl was missing again she announced that she was missing and i checked the time and saw that it was past midnight the historian and i stepped out to find her, but we were stopped by the freshman rep and the president. They wanted to find her and have us stay back so that we could let the vice president and treasurer know. We were all in the kitchen waiting for them to return. What happens next is basically all hell broke loose and I seriously thought we were all going to die. The historian and I here crying from a distance. It got closer, and the president and freshman representative appeared from the shadows carrying the PR girl. She's crying hysterically, and we all go outside. They set her on a bench, and she starts saying something like, He won't leave me alone, he keeps following me. The president called his sister, and gave the phone to the PR girl so she could describe what she saw. She said she saw a reptilian looking man with a lion's tail. The historian ushered us to go inside by saying, these are things we should not talk about outside. Everyone was getting nervous and what happened next scarred me for life. As everyone rushes in, the president gives me the phone. His sister tells me 
that I have to go outside and call the PR girl's spirit back. For she has lost it due to fear. At this moment I'm thinking, why me? Seriously, why me? I couldn't say no. So I went back outside and started calling the PR girl's full name in my native tongue. Then suddenly, from all directions, a loud growl echoes towards me. I get chills, goosebumps everywhere. All the hairs on my body are on end. Then the trees start shaking. I start shaking. And I think this is my last night on earth alive. I yelled for it to leave us alone in my language and ran back inside as fast as I could. I started yelling and ran to the living room until I realized the PR girl started hyperventilating. She was falling off the couch crying and making strange noises, but we moved her onto the floor mattress. The freshman rep mentions he has a priest who might be able to help us, but I was so scared that I didn't want to involve anyone, but we were desperate. The president was on the phone to his shamanic sister and her shaman master. The historian was on the phone with her mother, talking about frying peppers to cleanse the house. It's another thing that we do. I finally called my dad and explained what was happening, and he had a few tricks up his sleeve. He told me to repeat these spells and asked me to perform them on the PR girl, but I couldn't say the spell for my life. They were in a different language and quite lengthy. I had to put my dad on speaker and perform the actions after he finished chanting. When my dad finished chanting, I wet my fingers with a little saliva and brushed her head and hair three times. Thankfully, she calmed down after that. We had some time to think now. No one was saying anything. I knew no one knew what to do. We were just trying to collect our thoughts. I think it was everyone's first time experiencing something like this. Next thing, the president pulls me into our room and the phone is handed to me. The shaman master tells me that it's time to pack up and go. I hit up the group chap saying, it's time to go. Now. Everyone began rushing to collect their things and no one is talking or exchanging looks. The PR girl is still out on the ground so I had to collect her things. When it was time to leave, I woke her and told her we were going to the store. She was confused, but it's a thing in our culture to not say we're going home when there are spirits present and such. We don't want anything to follow us home. She argues with me why we're going to the store at this time. So I had to be kind of rude and force her to get up. Everything that has been opened had to be thrown away. So all the leftover food was trashed. We get into our cars and drive 70 on a 35. The phone is handed to me again, but it's the president, Shane Manick's sister, and tells us to go back to campus, which was more than an hour drive. But I was like, hell no, take me to my parents. I got home and my dad is in the doorway waiting for me with a red string. He ties it on my wrist and says goodnight, and then he walks to his room. This is my first paranormal experience ever, and my first ever red string. People from my ethnic group and culture are always wearing them on their wrists, ankle and neck, but I never needed one until now. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the fourth instalment of Nature Week. Remember to tune in to our grand finale tomorrow for even more horrors with skinwalkers and wendigos. And sorry if my voice is a little bit off, I've got a bit of a cold. It was a lot worse in the morning, but it's a lot better now, so I hope that the recording was okay. I want to give a special thanks to my amazing patrons who help support the channel financially. Their names are on screen now. Your help is seriously invaluable and goes a lot further than you think. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for all your generosity. 
I'm able to keep making content for you guys every day because of you. And if you're interested in becoming a patron to help support the channel a bit further, feel free to check out the link in the description. But of course, please do not feel obligated in any way. I also want to give a big shout out to Black Metal Nazgul. Thank you for watching and always liking and commenting both on here and Instagram. Really appreciating the support bro. And in response to your comment in yesterday's video, I do not have any family currently residing in the States. And it would have been an awesome coincidence and a small world indeed. I really hope that you guys did enjoy today's video, which turned out to be a lot longer than expected. And if you did, it would certainly mean a lot to me if you would just drop that little like and a comment, as it goes a long way in helping more people with a taste for horror find my channel. It helps me grow, and it helps me be promoted on the side more so other people can find the content. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the little bell icon to be up to date with everything I post. I know you're not going to want to miss it. If you would like me to read your story on my channel, feel free to send it to my email or share it to my Reddit page. They can both be found in the description. Just an important note though, please make sure to paragraph your emails or your Reddit posts as it makes it a lot easier to read than just a wall of text. Try adding in a lot of detail about your story to really give a feel of what happened as it will really maximize the chances of me reading it out but anyway for now guys i'm going to sign off stay awesome and i'll see you in the next one